Okay, um, we'll go ahead and get started today. Um, what we're going to do is actually start getting into easing into the the pool of Jupyter notebooks and and Python. Um, so I I hope that you have had a chance to install Anaconda um, on your machine, or you've already had um, either Anaconda or Miniconda. Um, how many of you have not done this quite yet? Okay. Um, I, I'll give you some time during class today to go ahead and and start doing that. I mean, you could start doing the install process now. Um, it it does take a little while. Um, and so this this is maybe um, so what I want to do right is today I want to talk about two things in in particular. Um, we'll we'll get into um, we'll get into Jupyter notebooks, but I'm going to take a, a side detour briefly um, to talk about Markdown, right? Um, and Markdown is going to be how we uh, it's it's just a it's a it's a relatively lightweight um, what's called a markup language, which I think is they called it Markdown, ironically because it's actually simpler than other mark up languages, but um, it's a simple formatting um, set of, I wouldn't even call it a language in and of itself, right? It's just some things we can do to make our text look, you know, organized, right? And it's very helpful when we're producing documentation for our GitHub repositories, but it's it's useful even outside of um, the Python Jupyter Notebook environment, right? So for those of you that are now or might be R users in the future, um, there's something called R Markdown, which is very similar to a Jupyter Notebook. Um, and R Markdown just in straight text files is how we build some of the documentation for um, our readme and other files uh, in, in GitHub, right? Um, so, um, okay, actually, let's do this. Um, let's go and we'll start the process of, of getting you to create a repo. So there's a couple of different ways to create a, a, a Git repository, right? Um, one way is that, um, You can do what we did last time, which was at the command line, right? What were the few commands that we used to initialize, see where we're at, stage something and commit something? What, how did we create a repository? Do you remember that command? Git init, right? And then what do we usually do? What do we, what's the always safe command we can issue to get? Git status. How do we stage something once we've saved a file or something? Git add, and then how do we finally commit something? Git commit with a message, okay? So that's one way, right? Another way is you can kind of create a repository in place. Right, so what I would like you to do now actually is open your um, GitHub profile. So just go to github.com and click sign in and go ahead and log into your GitHub account. Make sure I use the right password. Okay, let's see. Okay. No. Okay. 
And as you can see, uh, it is now, GitHub is now using two-factor authentication. So I'm gonna enter my verification code. Okay, so you should see something like this, right? Everybody here approximately. Okay, another way to create um, a repository is to just go over here and to click new repository. Okay. Um, and it's going to bring up a dialogue that's something like this. And this is just the information that you uh, that you, you're going to enter here the information about this repository, right? So um, I'm a part of several different kind of development teams. You all, in all likelihood, um, un unless you're kind of involved with or have been added to another project um, from a, you know, that has a GitHub team, um, you can always create repositories under yourself. Okay, um, and we want to create a repository name. So what I what we're going to do now is we're going to create the basics of a GitHub repository that you will use for the whole class, right? So um, so whatever you want to call this repository, make it something memorable, right? Um, make it something that is, you know, um, unique as well. Right, so um, I, I just, I have my own repository for this. So I'm going to ultimately delete this repository after class. Um, but if it were me, right, I would, I would call this something like geos 505 dash. You can use dashes, you can use underscores, but this has to be a continuous name um, because this is gonna form the basis of a URL um, to which your repository links. Um, and you can call it something like fall 2022, right? And then add a description. In this case, I'll call it maybe um, research computing in the earth and environmental sciences. This can be longer. And you can use parentheses fall 2022. Okay, okay. Um, you can also create public repositories. You can create private repositories. In this case, um, I would like you to create your repository as public. Um, that'll allow me to see it without you having to add special permissions for me to see your repository. Um, but, you know, don't worry. There is There are plenty of totally incomplete and weird GitHub repositories out there that contain nothing, that contain code that doesn't even work, that contain just text files, right? So don't worry that people are gonna be scraping the web and inferring anything about your professional capabilities based on a single GitHub repository, okay? Um, and at the end of the semester, you can make it private, you can delete the repository, whatever, okay? Um, okay, so, other than that, that I I um I I want you to leave all of these other options kind of unchecked. So let's leave it as a public repository. We will not not add a README file at the moment. Um, we will not add a .git ignore file. I'll talk about that when we do our kind of advanced Git kind of thing later on. Thank you for. Um, doing the survey, by the way, I'll, I'll announce via Canvas kind of when we'll meet up as a Python programming and pizza 3P um, kind of thing. Um, and at the moment, we're not going to add a license. We'll also talk about licenses and the ramifications of the license that you choose. Okay, so just click create repository. Okay. So now our repository is created. And if you look at the URL, it should look something like this, right? It should be something like github.com forward slash Leho Flores or your username forward slash whatever the name of the repository is, okay? Okay. 
So, um, yeah, let me. Can, okay, so if you create a repository and you decide you don't like the name because it's ambiguous, um, or uh, if you want to change the name, um, can you can you edit the name of the repository? Um, the answer is yes. So you could go to settings here. And um, in the general settings, you can change the repository name, okay? Um, to, to whatever you indicate here, right? Um, so, you know, if I wanted to add something else, right? Dash whoever, right? Um, if I wanted to take off the GS505, I could and use something else, res comp, right? Um, you could do that and click rename and it would rename it, right? And and the settings would propagate through to the um, to the URL name, right? So the URL referencing it would then be different. It would be whatever you updated it to. Okay, does that help? Did that answer your question? Okay. All right, so let's go back to, right? So, okay, so quick setup. So, um, this is, so this page is sort of important. Again, we're not going to cover most of this until we get to that kind of advanced things. But, you know, oftentimes the way that, that I will do things on when I'm programming, right, is, is this is what constitutes now a, a quote unquote remote, right? So we have a remote repository, a repository that is set up on GitHub servers somewhere in I don't know where, right? Probably Central Oregon or Iowa or Virginia, depending on where their server farms are, okay? Um, how do I interact with that repository, right? That repository is, is now someplace else, okay? Um, we'll get to how to bring that repository down onto my local machine. Um, and then in that advanced, advanced GitHub user or advanced Git um, uh, session, we'll cover how to push changes to it, right? But the important thing now is that we have kind of, we would have then our repository in two places, right? So what's nice about that is that our remote, if it's, if it's kept up to date, is kind of a backup copy of our repository. Right, so it's a version of our repository we can put on other computers elsewhere. It's a version of our repository we, we can share with other people if it's code that they might want to use. It's a version of the repository that if something strange happens to my computer, like the hard drive fails, um, the motherboard fails, I drop my computer and everything fails, I can now pull that back, right, and get right back to where my code was. Okay. So once we have our remote, we're now in a pretty powerful place. So the, the instructions you're given here, right, are a couple of different things. Um, so you can create a new repository on the command line, right? So um, I could create this same repository at the command line, um, and I could on my computer and I could push changes to it, right? Or, and this is most of the time what I will do is I will start my repository on my local computer, right? I'll be doing a little bit of coding and then I'll decide, okay, it's time to actually create a repository and push this to GitHub, right? I've invested enough time in this little piece of code now that it needs to be backed up someplace. So I will go through this, um, I'll go through everything that we did. I'll do a git init, a git add, a git commit, right? And then what I need to do is add my remote, right? I need to tell my local GitHub, hey, this is where the remote version of this repository is kept. And then what I need to tell Git is I need to tell Git to push this local repository and the minus U here means upstream, right? So I need to push it upstream to the remote, okay? So the other commands we'll be using 
in that advanced session will be get push and get pull. Okay. We don't really need to worry about that right now. I don't want to get into that. Um, we'll, we'll cover that kind of pushing and pulling activity once we do. Um, I think we'll do next week sometime um, for an advanced Git session. Okay. But what I want to do is show you how we can actually create um, a new file in GitHub. Let's see, how can I, what do I want to do? Okay, so Okay, so what I would like to do is actually create, and I'm going to have to Google this. Okay, so okay, so I I missed it. It was totally sitting right here in front of me. Okay, so if we see here, it says get started by creating a new file or uploading an existing file. Okay, so what we're gonna do is um, go ahead and click on that new file. Okay, um, and. What I want you to do is I want you to, so if, if you take a look at this, right, um, it's now showing me that um, this file will be created in geos505-fall2022. That's the name of my repository, forward slash, and then the name of the file, whatever I want to call it, okay? So in this case, I want you to very specifically entitle this readme, all caps, dot md and i want you to hit enter okay now nothing has happened which is what we would have expected but if we if we take a look at what we have now here um so the little angle brackets here indicate that this is code right this is whatever code you want to add the .md file here indicates to GitHub that we have now created a markdown file, right? So GitHub is in, is in um, will interpret this file once we save the changes as a so-called markdown file, okay? So what I wanna do is I'm going to um, ask you to kind of type along with me a couple of different couple of different things. Um, and then we're going to save the file. We're going to look at it. Okay. And then I'm going to give you some resources. We're going to sort of see what, what did we do with this markdown file? What was special about what we did? I'm going to find a resource for you to use. Um, and then I'm going to let you update this readme file and I'm going to give you sort of three tasks to do, okay? Okay, so what I'd like you to do is um, start off by typing the pound sign or the hash sign, and then a space, and then um, whatever the a descriptive title of this repository, right? 505, GS 505, colon, research, computing in the earth, and environmental sciences, and then a return. Why don't I zoom in on this? Okay. Add a add a, a line space. Okay, um, and then 
what I'd like you to do is type, uh, uh, let's do two hash symbols and then maybe your name. Okay, and then um, let's do, um, let's do this. Let's do, uh, email colon square bracket my email address and then left parentheses my email address again actually before this let's put uh, I think that should be okay Okay. Then I want you to stop there. Um, okay, I want you to scroll down to the end of this and you'll see a little comment here, right? Or a little sort of dialogue box that says commit new file, right? Where have we seen this commit before? In the git commit command, right? Okay, um, and then it asks for a description of some kind and it gives a, a hint, create readme file. What have we, where have we seen a message go with a command? With git commit, right? So what this little dialogue is doing for us is that it will immediately commit this new file, right? It will add it, right? There's no, really no need to stage it because we've, we're committing it on the, we're making it on the repository, right? So we can proceed immediately to committing this new file and you can add whatever description you wanna add. You can add an extended description, which is something you can also do from the command line, but we almost never do. Um, but whatever you wanna add in terms of that, um, uh, that message, go ahead and add that. And then when you're ready, click commit new file. Okay. And then, Look what happened, right? So let's let's go back up and let me show you, let's see, are we, okay, so if I click that link, just the repository name, what did it do? Let's, um, let's, so if we go back and we look, if we click on this readme file here, Right, and what I want you to do is go over here and click either raw or um, display source blob. Okay. So what did this hash symbol here, this single hash symbol do? It made a title or, or a header, right? Um, specifically in a, a header one, an H1 field, okay? Um, what did the two hash symbols do? It made an H2, okay? And then if I go here, right? Um, if I click on this, I don't know what this does. Okay, so I didn't get this right. That's okay, okay. Um, but what did I try to do here with this code? What was my intent? Make a hyperlink, right? In particular, uh, a mail to, right? Um, so what I can do is say, okay, well, I didn't get this quite right, so uh, maybe what I'll do is click this pencil and it will allow me to edit the file and I can go through and I can try what uh, is done in HTML land, which is a mail to colon lejoflores at boisestate.edu, right? So if anybody uh, had to torture yourselves and ever learn anything about HTML, you'll know that mail to was the way to create um, a hyperlink that prompted um, prompted a mail dialog to open. Um, and I can scroll down and I can commit this change, right? So the change is update readme. I could be a little more specific and say fix email hyperlink and commit change. 
Okay. So now, aha, right? So now that's working, but I don't want to configure Outlook right now. So I'm going to kill out of that. Okay. Okay. So, and what is this README file? Right, so, so a really key insight here is that the readme file by default, right, when we go to this repository, if we look at the, H, the URL here, right, this is the address of, um, of that GitHub repository that you just created. And when we click on that hyperlink, GitHub explicitly looks for a readme file and then it renders it by interpreting the markdown text, okay? So markdown is, um, is a pretty cool thing that allows us to format the text to kind of look nice. We can do all kinds of things with markdown. We can insert images here. Um, we can, there's a way to, uh, there's a, a, a LaTeX, interpreter that we can access with Markdown, right? So we can add equations when we need to. Um, there's a variety of things that we can do with Markdown, okay? I, um, and, I, and I want to encourage you to commit to memory exactly nothing about the formatters for Markdown because there, there are tons of Markdown um, cheat sheets out there. And in fact, if I look for a Markdown, cheat sheet, it's the first thing that comes up, right? And in particular, I wanna look for a GitHub Markdown cheat sheet. So Markdown itself is broader than GitHub. So GitHub has like a slightly smaller version of everything Markdown can do. Um, it's it's often called GitHub, the GitHub flavor of Markdown, but it's, it's a lot of things, right? Other things that I forgot to tell you, it can do tables, it can do a variety of other things, right? So if we Google Markdown, cheat sheet for GitHub, we will find actually on GitHub, somebody who has put a markdown cheat sheet for us. Um, right, and so, so here is um, a, a cheat sheet that's in, in markdown, right? So this is sort of getting meta a little bit, like a markdown cheat sheet written in markdown, okay? Um, you can also find uh, PDF versions of this. Um, so this is, yes, the GitHub flavored markdown. So I can download this. Um, let me download this to the desktop and then we'll open this, right? So uh, I do not want, want to open that in. Just not have Acrobat open with. No, it does not. Okay. Uh, we'll open it in Chrome. Okay. And if I zoom in here, right, um, this is printable, right? So um, you can print these as kind of as, as physical cheat sheets if, if you like, right? Um, and you know, there's all kinds of things. You can create tables, you can insert different emojis, right? There's all, there's, you can create code blocks, right? You can create task lists. Okay, there's all kinds of things that you can do with um, Git Markdown, okay? GitHub Markdown. Okay, um, it shows you how to do images, how to do links. Okay. Okay, so what I want you to do um, is take maybe 15 minutes um, and what I'd like you to do is I want you to edit this markdown file, this readme.markdown file. And in particular, um, what I would like you to do, and this is consistent with the homework, which is not quite posted yet. Stop. 
Nope. It's in the Kawasi one. Um, what I would like you to do is I want you to list at least three goals that you have with respect to advancing your scientific programming skills throughout the course of the semester. And I want these goals to be SMART, right? Do you all remember, have you all heard of SMART goals? Okay, so, okay, so I'm gonna do this in, in line here while, while we're going, I'm gonna create a table S is for specific. M is for measurable. A is for attainable smart specific, measurable, yeah, attainable, that's right, achievable, yeah. R is relevant, and T is time bound, All right? I got my table all wrong. So I'm going to look at my cheat sheet and see what I did wrong. No, oh, I don't think I needed the It's still not right. Uh oh. The T was okay. When is it like the T? Still not right. Okay. 
All right, so um, go ahead and take 15 minutes to do this. Um, and then what I'd like you to do is um, turn and share those goals if you're comfortable doing so with um, the person that you're um, at a desk with. Okay, and just spend like another two or three minutes reviewing what those what those goals are and, and maybe find places where you have similarities and places where you have some differences, okay?
Okay, when folks are ready to proceed, again, I forgot the sticky notes, but um, I should like leave them here someplace hidden. Um, but when you're ready, go ahead and put your blue sticky note up. Okay. All right. So, just by show of hands, um, how many of you have, um, you know, some commonalities with your neighbors in terms of your goals? Kind of. Yeah. So, usually that's the case, right? Um, and as we saw in like the computing survey, right? There's a lot of folks across a broad range of spectrums here. Okay, so we've now seen two different ways to create and add content to a GitHub repository or a Git repository, right? We've seen on our local machines how we can use Git at the command line and using Git init, Git status, Git add, Git commit how to add content to that repository to start keeping it under control. Um, and we've seen now how to create a remote version of a repository on GitHub directly, right? Clicking through a web interface to create that repository and we can actually add content to this repository, right? What you're, what you're adding now, right, is even a step more sophisticated than what we did with the GitHub so Git software carpentry lesson, right? Um, we were just adding text files last time about Dracula and Mars, right? Um, so now the next step will just be to make sure that we can get the two to communicate, right? Get our local to communicate with the remote, okay? All right, so now we're gonna start actually pivoting into, into Python land, right? Um, and so what I want you to do is go ahead and um, open Anaconda. And um, I wanna take a, a brief aside here to provide a little bit of context about what exactly Anaconda is, what, what it's not, um, and kind of why we use it and why you might not want to use it, okay? So Anaconda is actually a 
a company. Um, it's a company that actually is uh, hires a lot of earth and environmental scientists. Um, so if they are providing, how many of you had to pay to download an Anaconda? Nobody, right? So if you didn't, if you didn't have to pay to download Anaconda, right? Um, and Anaconda is a company. How do they make their money? I don't, not exactly that. Although that's a good, maybe they do. I don't know. Now I'm a little worried. Okay. <laughs> what's, what's another, what's another thing they might do? And I just gave you a hint by telling you that they actually do hire a number of earth and environmental scientists. You're getting closer. What's that? Yeah, so uh, consulting, right? It's, it falls under the broad topic of consulting. So they have a bunch of people um, that work for the company um, that, that actually their job is to go out and help other companies, right? They help other companies um, by building software for them. You know, these days it's a lot of like machine learning software for individual companies. Um, some of them are earth science applications, right? So for instance, um, what are some companies that, you know, might be interested in, for instance, having a dashboard that gives them information about weather and things like precipitation and temperature and humidity, like nationally? Well, if NOAA is a government agency, it looks, yeah. Kachinga? So NCAR is also a research agency, right? Um, I'm thinking like, you know, more, a little bit more, you know, people that are just trying to make money, right? Where, where, what are some companies in the U.S. Um, where, you know, the what the weather is might affect the bottom line? Boeing, Y Vale Resorts, ski companies, right? Yeah, we want to know about like what the what the snow is going to be. What why Boeing? Yeah. Aircraft. We're getting closer there, right? So maybe the airlines, right? The airlines maybe want a competitive advantage over their competitors, right? Um, and if they can get folks more reliably to airports. Right, that that will be seen as a value add. Yeah, Jerry. Uh, uh, airline aircraft actually it may not you may not know it, but air aircraft actually contribute their data. Um, so they're taking like data in the air, like upper air data. Um, and they actually will transmit that to NOAA, which then assimilates it into their models. Um, but. No, they might harvest NOAA data to produce value-added products using some of these tools. Other thoughts? What about, let me throw one out. What about Walmart? Would, Wal, would, would the weather affect Walmart's bottom line? And if so, how? Okay, so that's one thing is just affecting like supplies and what supplies are like needed. Right. What else? Yeah. Okay. So the weather affects people's behaviors. Okay. Supply chain. Right. So, how many of you have seen a Walmart truck out on the highway? Right. So they're moving all kinds of stuff all across the country. Okay. And the weather affects their supply chain. Right, precipitation does, probability of tornadoes does, the temperature can, right? Um, and so, so a lot of companies, right, will pay companies like Anaconda to come in and bring a team of people. For instance, this is an example application. It's not the only one, but it'll say, for instance, like, hey, you know, our company really needs kind of a, a dashboard that tells us 
gives us weather forecast information at our big distribution centers, right? The places that really matter and also kind of the spokes that connect our stores, right? And so we need somebody to come in. And some of this is proprietary information, so we don't want everybody knowing this stuff. So we want somebody to come in and develop, pull data from, for instance, the National Weather Service or NOAA or NCAR and interpret it in a way that's helpful for our own business application, right? And so they will pay companies like Anaconda to come and set that up for them. And in doing so, the people that work at Anaconda actually spend time just maintaining and updating the software, right? Which they then make freely available, right? And so why do they make it freely available? Well, presumably at some of those companies, there are people that are starting to do this and thinking like, hey, you know, I can make a dashboard for our company on, you know, distribution, weather forecast at distribution centers. And they get far enough along to know, like, we just need to hire this out, right? We, we have reached the limits our, of our capacity to actually do this. We can pay the person to keep that dashboard updated, but we can't pay for the dashboard to be created, right? So... Anaconda offers this software in part because they're hoping that people find it useful enough um, that they might hire the actual company to come in and do some development, right? Um, but in doing so, they also know, and I've, you know, I'm on some regular phone calls with some folks from Anaconda, that this the these software packages are really useful for science, right? And and they do. There are people that will. Present from Anaconda, for instance, at um, AGU, at AMS, um, and at other kind of scientific conferences. Okay, so Anaconda itself is a, a big package, right? So what Anaconda does is, um, is it says, I'm assuming that there's a ton of, you know, I'm I'm going to install every Python package that. I think you will need, right? I'm going to install all these plotting packages. I'm going to install all of these uh, science and numerical packages, all of these machine learning packages, because I'm, I'm just trying to reach the broadest audience that I possibly can, okay? Um, why is that sometimes not the greatest thing? What's the likelihood that you're going to use all of the packages that Anaconda installs by default? Pretty low, right? Um, and so one of the one of the challenges are that you know it it installs a bunch of software or a bunch of libraries, a bunch of Python packages that um, we may not entirely need or want or ever get to. Okay. So its philosophy is to say, hey, install as much as possible and then just hope that you don't need to install much more. Uh, another philosophy, right, is, is that um, which is represented by Miniconda, which is also produced by Anaconda. Um, which kind of takes the opposite approach, right? So Miniconda works by saying, okay, I'm going to install some very, very basic things, right? Base Python, I think maybe NumPy. And above and beyond that, I'm going to let you install what you need. I'm going to let you grow your own Python software stack as you need to grow it. Okay. So contrasts and differences between them. Anaconda is a really great place to start because the likelihood is that you don't, you aren't going to need to, um, you aren't going to need to install a bunch of additional libraries, right? Most of what you will need will be here. And in fact, I think most of what you need for the entire semester um, is, is, is already installed when you install Anaconda, right? And that's why the software carpentry workshops take the approach of, if you're just starting off, install Anaconda. You can, however, very quickly get to this situation in which you're like, okay, there's a lot going on here. I updated one of my libraries and then it messed with one of my other libraries. 
And now this piece of code that was working five minutes ago does not work, right? And that's why you might opt for Miniconda instead. Okay. Okay. The next thing is, regardless of whether it's Miniconda or Anaconda, um, this issue of environments is um, a, a really, a really kind of critical one, right? So, an environment, right, is basically um, you can think of it as a container in which I have very specific pieces of software installed, right? And so this is actually like a good compromise between Anaconda and Miniconda, right? So what environments do is they can basically wall off my installations of, of, of Python so that my different environments do not interfere with one another, right? So often what we will do is we will create a new environment for each project that we undertake, okay? And so, what we will do, for instance, is I can create um, I can create a new environment here. I can say that this is um, you know geostats, right? So if if I want to create an environment that's just for kind of some geostatistical stuff, and I want that to be a, a Python um, a Python environment, I can create a new Python environment. I can also do R. Right, so Anaconda also sees that a lot of people use R and I can create a new environment. And what that's gonna do is it's going to install um, a few of these packages. Might take a little while, okay. But if you if you see here, right, this is this is so-called base. This is my base installation. When I look at, at my base installation, it takes a while to toggle between them, right? There's a whole bunch of things in here that look cool, but probably not things that I need or want. This is either a cryptography or a cryptocurrency. Um, library, right? AstroPy is probably something related to processing astronomical data. Um, you know, we can, I can, I usually like to kind of go through here and find some of the funnier ones that are installed. Um, let's see. Um, there's usually some There's usually like a lot of machine learning ones installed here, right? Whereas if I contrast that with this environment that I just created, there's a lot less in here, okay? And I, 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 can, I can opt to only install packages uh, as I go along, okay? So how do I install packages? Okay, well, um, I can, let's see. Where was that? Set packages? Yeah. Oh, search packages. I Okay, so I need to make sure that... Um, so, okay, so let's do this, all right? I'm going to do... Um, let's see, not installed. There's a ton there. So installed, I wanna search, I'll search for Jupiter. Okay. And right now I'm just searching in the installed packages. I'm gonna search for packages that are not installed. And I want to install Jupiter Lab, right? So I'm gonna go down here and find Jupiter Lab and I'm gonna install Jupiter Lab. And when I click that, I'm only gonna click Jupiter Lab. And um, I'll hit apply. 
and it's going to give me some things. Um, and it's going to say that 82 packages are going to be installed. Okay. All right. But that's okay. So these packages that it's installing are actually what are known as the dependencies, right? So Jupyter Lab, installing Jupyter Lab depends on installing these other, other libraries, right? So even though I'm just installing Jupyter Lab, that's the only thing I want. It, I, it, Jupyter Lab does depend on these other packages within Python. So I'll click apply and it's gonna install. It's gonna take a while, um, but that's okay. You can see all of the, you can sort of track the status down here of all of the different packages it's installing. Usually when it's getting up to the, the jupe, right? So these are often installed there's a, the order of installation is important. Yes. Right, so it'll start with the packages that have the least dependencies and if anything depends on, right? So these dependencies are often sort of hierarchical, right? So some of these dependencies depend on other things, right? Um, hence kind of why we need these things installed. So, okay, so now if I wanna look um, at my installed applications, um, Jupyter Lab is here now, right? But also what's been installed, uh, let me click out of this, is a whole bunch of other, a whole bunch of other applications, okay? Or a whole bunch of other libraries. Okay. Um, the nice thing is though, so for instance, um, if there's a, pa there's a package that I know of, right? Um, and it is not installed. So I'm gonna go here and click all. There's a package I know of that's called X-Array. This is a package I use all the time. Okay. And if I know that I really need to make use of X-Array because X-Array is great for reading in, you know, for instance, uh, a whole time series of like camera trap data, right? So I have camera trap data that's looking at water levels in a river, and I want to turn that camera trap data into a stage discharge relationship, right? Um, I have um, daily Landsat images for a year, not Landsat, um, eight day Landsat images for five years, right? And I want to stack all of them and do some kind of spatiotemporal analysis on that data. X-Ray is a wonderful package for that, and we'll see why that is in coming weeks. But let's say that I know that I'm going to need this. I want to install X-Ray, so I'm going to click Apply here. And again, right, it's going to say you, there's a whole bunch of additional packages that you need, right? Um, core among these are things like Pandas, NumPy, and, um, and several others, right? So, and if you see here, the asterisk indicates the package is a dependency of the selected package, right? So all of these are dependencies of X survey, okay? So when I click apply, again, it's gonna take a while. Okay, so now it is installed. Okay, but a really nice thing about this is although it had to install a whole bunch of additional things, um, some of those are useful in and of themselves, right? So NumPy is a package that we are going to use essentially all the time. Pandas is a package we are also going to use all the time, right? And so even though I had to install these dependencies, a lot of them are going to be useful, okay? 
Now, another key thing about environments, for instance, is let's say there's some other, let's see, is, is it installed here? Okay, so let's say that, okay, part of my, part of my research, part of my research is about analyzing spatiotemporal data. Right, so it's about just doing some Landsat analyses. It's about looking at drone images, right? Something like that. But part of it is also kind of analyzing individual sensor data, right? And might be kind of more time series, maybe even some machine learning kind of, you know, looking at multiple time series and doing some machine learning stuff, right? And so I want to install some other package, something called Scikit-Learn right, which does a bunch of machine learning stuff, but it also depends on, it also depends on things like NumPy and Pandas, okay. But I'm worried now that as X-Ray continues to develop and is updated, right, if it sort of has specific requirements of NumPy, and I update X-Ray and it updates NumPy, but scikit-learn does not update and still has a reliance on a certain version of NumPy, NumPy, I might start to get a conflict, right? So I could update X-Ray having the best of intentions to like make sure that my version of X-Ray is up to date and not buggy and I'm getting all the latest and greatest features. And so I do that, but then I go to do my machine learning stuff, which is kind of completely separate. Um, and after I did that X-ray update, I tried this thing in scikit-learn and it says, hey, I can't find this NumPy function, right? Or something with NumPy isn't working quite right, okay? What happened with that? No, not quite that. It's a little bit like down more in the bowels of the software. Yeah, so num, yeah, exactly. So by updating X-Ray, I updated NumPy and scikit-learn is depending on a previous version of NumPy. And so, but all it has is its disposal is this newer version of NumPy where something changed a little bit and it doesn't know how to use it anymore, right? So the dependency is broken, right? This happens frequently. In fact, Rainy can tell you about this, right? Rainy and Juice have been encountering an issue with this, okay? What's a potential workaround for this? So now I have two different scientific workflows I'm trying to do. One is spatiotemporal analysis of imagery data. Another one is kind of time series machine learning type stuff. Yeah, exactly. Create a new environment that is dedicated to my machine learning workflows, right? So now I'm going to call this Hydro ML workflow. And it's again going to be Python based. going to take a while to install. Okay. So here's my base installation. Now what I want to do is go ahead and install kind of that capstone piece of software I need, which is called scikit-learn. Scikit-learn. So this is the one. Okay. And I'm going to install this one. And similarly, it's going to say, hey, you need a whole bunch of different applications installed. And a lot of them are dependencies, right? So here we see that NumPy is a dependency. Okay. And so I'll go ahead and click apply here in my Hydro Learning Hydro ML workflow.
Okay, so now scikit-learn is installed. I want to look at my installed packages, but so is NumPy. And in fact, it's version 1.21.5 of NumPy that just got installed when I installed scikit-learn. I'm going to go back to my geostats environment. I'm going to check the version of NumPy that got installed here. This is 1.23.1, right? So when I did this, it installed different versions of NumPy. Now that's probably okay, right? There's not huge changes to NumPy from each version or patch. The second, the second number here is the subversion. The third number is the patch. Right, so there's probably not big changes or big differences between those versions of NumPy. So most of the time it would be okay to have scikit-learn and X-Ray installed, but sometimes it won't be, right? And you'll never know until you unfortunately try when it's gonna be a problem, right? So keeping environments that are as separate as possible is something that will be helpful. Sometimes, for instance, if you need to do, for instance, machine learning with spatiotemporal data, you can't avoid having both scikit-learn and X-ray installed simultaneously. There's ways to kind of work through that as well, okay? But the two lessons here, one is um, environments are your friend. Creating new, it's, you know, there's no limit to the number of environments that you can actually create, okay? It's a really good way to kind of wall off your installations of one package from an another. Um, and then two, be careful with your updates, right? We always have that sort of instinct to update, right? Um, it's kind of what we're taught, uh, you know, it's, it's usually... If you're getting messages to, upstop, to update your operating system, it's not good. It's because there's some security breach that is really timely. Um, but when it comes to this stuff, you can often sort of take a slower approach, right? You don't necessarily, you can stay a couple versions behind. And there's actually ways to report out which version of a software package or a Python library you're learning, you're using. And um, we'll show you how to do that. And that can be a helpful thing too. It's sort of promoting the reproducibility and the reusability of your code, okay? All right, so Tuesday, we're gonna jump right in and start creating some Jupyter Notebooks. So um, I would encourage you maybe to, um, to create your own environment um, for at least the first part of the class, right? Where we're gonna be doing some stuff uh, the first part of the, the, the Python portion of the class where we're going to be doing stuff with especially NumPy and Pandas. Okay. All right. I'll see you all next Tuesday.